our Discord as well. But this class is going to be taking you from the sketchbook stage into the story beat stage, which is where we're going to start to figure out what are those basic events of the story and what is the general shape and order in which they should go. You don't have to figure out every single scene, um, and you'll have one week uh, of additional outlining after this in which you'll actually expand that story beats outline into a full set of scene cards, which is a full paragraph for every scene. But so this week we'll be talking pilot structure. Let's get started here. So um, Skill Camp is our company. You can drop by all our new servers and join up with many new events that are coming out, and you can come say hi. We have Film Camp, Creator Camp, Tune Camp, Word Camp, Design Camp, and oh, Lingo Camp has a little logo now. That's great. Okay, so sort of a lime green and black uh, color scheme for that one. Um, and Code Camp. And we have new class series that have already started in several of these. So this is all included in your membership if you are a member. Um, we have things like uh, Animation Lab, which is Thursdays. Python Boot Camp, which starts next month on November 20th, but that's going to take you through the basics of using Python coding software or coding language. Shows how much I know about coding. I should probably take the class. Yeah, just to um, mention the Python, this is sometimes considered a great language to start with coding. So this is designed for someone who just, even if you have absolutely zero experience with programming or, you know, it's introducing the concepts as well as like language. And by the end of the six week, you will have um, a few a uh, video coding, oh, coding yeah. projects completed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Okay>. You have <laughs> a full Xbox 360 video game. Um, great. No, you, you'll have, you have designed a new Xbox. Oh, okay. Entirely out of code. Well, I've got to take that class now. Um, so that's starting November 20th, and that's going to be, um, you said six weeks, and that November 20th is a Sunday. So that'll be Sundays at noon, starting late next month. Um, yes. Now, although we probably will take a little time. We may have uh, holidays might affect the class dates a little bit. Go ahead, Nacho. Yeah, and also <clears throat> more um, film and creator camp classes uh, in November. Awesome. Yeah, we had two yesterday. We had Painting with Light and uh, Lighting Home Studio on Film Camp and Creative camp, Creator Camp, respectively. So um, plenty of new stuff coming out. You are, just by being a member, you get access to all of these classes, every lab, every workshop, every activity. So highly recommend signing up for Unlimited if you have not already done so. And then in terms of what I'm teaching, I'm still doing feature, TV, novels, and lab. So feature is Fridays 6 to 8. These are all in Pacific time, by the way. Um, novels is 12 to 2 for, on Saturdays for the rest of the entire year, but we're halfway through that course now, so I probably wouldn't join now, but you can always follow along or just like show up for the class and, and listen in if you want to. And then this pilot boot camp, which is um, going to be from 11 to 1 on Sundays uh, for six weeks. So we have four weeks left after this class. Um, and then Nacho is doing analysis, which is on Thursdays at 7 o'clock. All right, so plenty of things to do. You can, like, maybe not even do every single thing because some stuff starts to, you know, we can only have so many hours free in a week, but we like to have lots of different things to offer, and um, Skill Camp is growing all the time. So we're glad to have you guys here to help us get things started and to uh, get this com help the company grow even more and, and, you know, join all these different servers with all these different great events and awesome new instructors. So, um, where are we for this one? Oh, last thing. Halloween Shorts Contest deadline is the end of tomorrow. So, there's no entry fee on this. You can write a f what one to five page horror short, um, and you can win an entire year of Script Camp, which is like 500 something, $588 value. You can win things like consultations, a year of Arc Studio Pro, premium fest film festival access on Filmocracy, free submission to the Script Hive's Killer Shorts Contest, as well as other things like hoodies and backpacks and laptop cases mouse pads and merchandise like that so no uh no cost to enter you might as well just write a one to five page horror short and enter scriptcamp.net slash halloween um there's all the rules and the specifics there but you can um you can also find on this server we have a channel that's called halloween shorts you can enter your short there and um uh attach a pdf remember just five page maximum on that so um Lots of things you can do to uh, participate, and you can always attend all our classes, which is great. You can donate to become a supporting member and get access to these boot camps and labs. That's what you know members are doing. You can volunteer. So if you know a skill or language that you'd like to teach, you can contact Nacho or me. Send us a message, or um, Connor at scriptcamp.net is the email. Or you can tell your friends. You can refer your friends, and you both get a free month of unlimited 
and a uh, free month of Arc Studio Pro, a great screenwriting software. So if you still need to enroll for some reason, you can do so. You can buy the bootcamp on its own, um, or you can become this supporting member for the uh, um, at the scriptcamp.net slash membership page, and you can get access to all the stuff that we mentioned. That's all included uh, by just paying the monthly fee, or you can buy it yearly for 40% off. And there's just a couple details about what these different tiers include. Yearly subscriptions are quite a big discount, so highly recommended. All right, um, and last, you can, if you want to get feedback on your script, you can go to scriptcamp.net slash coverage, and you can buy a full set of notes from me and a half-hour call to explain the major points and answer questions that you have. Okay, so um, Story Beats outline. This is where we are in this class today. We are... Um, this is technically the third week, but this is just week two because we had that week zero as the overview and introduction. So we started with log lines and trying to workshop that log line to refine that basic idea of the show into one single sentence. Week one was we're trying to figure out why exactly we're picking this story, who's the main character, what are they trying to do, and what are just some of these major elements, like who's going to be in our cast, what is the basic premise of this, and we're going to work to be filling out that sketchbook as much as you can, which is just going to be an unsorted list of all your inspirations and research materials and ideas that you have for lines of dialogue, characters, locations, or anything like that that matters in your world. Today, we'll be looking at organizing what you have into a set of logical story moments. Um, these are going to be the major scenes. If you're writing half an hour, this is going to be half as much work as if you're doing a full hour. So in that sense, you are incentivized to pick the shorter idea. If you have multiple ideas to choose from, writing a whole script in six weeks is not always the easiest thing. So if you're just starting out at this, maybe pick the more manageable project, meaning probably not a historical, probably not something that involves a lot of research, d definitely not something that involves time travel, um, and just focusing on picking something that you know you can accomplish within the time span. Um, so we'll be doing story beats today, then tomorrow we have, or not tomorrow, next week we'll do outlining, so we're going to be completing scene cards. Full paragraph for every scene, so we should know what happens on every page of the pilot before we begin. And then the second half of the course, weeks four, five, and six, each week focuses on a specific act. So week four has lecture on first act, and then um, week five is second act, and week six is third act. Your final draft should be completed by December 4th. And in the second half of class, you'll be writing 10 pages a week if you're doing half hour, and 20 pages a week if you're doing full hour. So that's about two pages a day on weekdays for half hour, and about four or five pages a day on weekdays for full hour. Um, so... Uh, let's just remind ourselves to, before we go further. Pilot in six weeks. Will this draft be good? No. Probably not. This is a first draft, and beyond that, you should move beyond the idea that any any individual script needs to be good or has any sort of uh, direct uh, hurdle that you're trying to jump over. The goal is to improve yourself. This is like lifting weights at the gym. The goal when you're lifting weights is not to lift the perfect weight or to, you know, you're not trying to win a contest by lifting weights. You're doing it to improve and to get better and to build the skills necessary to do bigger stuff. So here we'll start with check-in today, and you'll tell us progress on your uh, uh, sketchbook and maybe just any questions, last questions you had on your logline before we finalize those and move on, because we're at the point where you need to actually start to zero in on what the show is and really flesh out this idea. We'll look at my process and just a quick overview of what we will go through in these five steps over these couple weeks. We we'll have um, a little talk on structure and breaking the story and figuring out just what are those major structural beats and how do we organize scenes within them? <clears throat> we'll look at some story beats from a pilot that I have been plotting, um, just kind of working on on the back burner for a couple months. But um, last night I just sat down and I was just like, oh, I'll just do the story beats. And I just wrote them out. And I've got a full, pretty much a full working idea of what that original that pilot story is going to be at this point. So we'll look at the, pi the outline for my historical dark comedy called Knave. We all have a little time for exercises and, of course, lots of time for questions. Okay, so if you've not already done so, you can go ahead and post your sketchbook and log lines in the assignments channel. You can do that in either PDF or format or in a Google Doc that you've made sure to check the sharing settings and ensure that anyone with the link can at least view them. Sometimes I like to mark them up so you can set me as an editor if you want to. If you really don't want to, that's fine, but at least make sure we can view. So go ahead and post um, sketchbook, logline, and pilot logline in the assignments channel, and we can review that. And then um, we will ask about recent scripts that you've read. So anything, any specifically TV that you've read recently that you want to tell us about. 
So we're just going to go down the list here, and um, I'll just call on people one by one. If you don't have too much to share, that's okay, but um, make sure to at least post what you've got. Nacho says my Discord stream settings are too low quality. Maybe change to 1080, 30 FPS. Okay, I can do that. And in the meantime, why don't we we'll start with Amanda. Amanda's working on a book, I think, but um, any updates you want to give us, Amanda? Um, I haven't read any TV lately. Um, yeah, I've been watching Dragon Prince. Um, so yeah, you can skip me. I just wanted to hop in and, and listen, see where you guys were. Okay, um, no problem. Thanks for sharing, Amanda. And Amanda's in the 12 week novel writing class boot camp, which is halfway through and is about to start pages, which is super exciting. Let's go to Benedice. Oh, hi. Um, can you hear me? I hear you fine. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I didn't actually do a sketchbook to drop in. Um, I'm doing a pilot on a man who's troubled by his doppelganger of his childhood arch enemy, and they're paired in a con college class and forced to practice communication styles. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so did you, you haven't been working on this this past week, you mean? You took a little break from it? Um, well, I already wrote the pilot, so it's a rewrite. Oh, okay. I missed that part. That's important. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but I'm going to do a complete rewrite in the class just because I figure it'll flesh out the details right, even that, better. That's a good idea. Um, cool. Um, and anything you've read recently? Um, not published stuff. I, I read a lot of um, novice work and, and seeing what, of what my friends are writing and stuff like that. So nothing okay, anybody so else would see. So for next week, try to read a complete professional TV pilot from beginning to mm -hmm. end. And we're going to ask that every single week and be super annoying about it. So make sure to just, we have a big directory of many, many, many TV scripts to choose from. So every week we'll ask, what did you read? What did you, it's not right or wrong answers. We'll just ask, what did you think? What did you notice? What did you learn? Stuff like that. Okay. Sounds great. Thanks Thank for you. the updates. Um, let's check with Dan. Oh, sorry. Yeah, well, I'm here. Go ahead. I've been read. I've uh, I have been reading a couple. As I mentioned before, I read Stranger Things pilot. It doesn't really have a lot to do with what I'm working on. So I did watch a couple of space-based cartoons. I rewatched a series that I had watched, which I think is similar to what I'm working on. So that helps. Great. Okay. Anything you noticed or learned from reading those things and watching those things? Well, I noticed that I'm really good at figuring out exactly what's going to happen when it's going to happen. Like, and this is going to happen. The moment's going to be ruined because there's 20 more minutes left in the show. Okay, sure. So you just are gaining a pretty good understanding of structure. You think? I'm really bad if you. Want, I'm, I'm really bad for non-writers to watch movie shows with. Mm. Yeah, I think many of us have had that happen before. Um, I'm more the more, shows, the more yeah. I watch, the more I read. I'm just noticing that aspect. So I guess that's a really important skill I'm realizing I've got. Yeah. The better or worse. It's almost a curse sometimes. It's good to start to understand and recognize elements of structure as they are happening in the show, though. So not a terrible thing. Um, and did you post a sketchbook in the assignments channel? I will. Sorry, I missed that. Did you, you said I will, I think. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Just love you. Let's check with Joel. Or maybe not. Is Joel here? So I am in my app that I can find a neat button. Um. So this is my first week in this camp. So I didn't know we meant to make a book or anything, so I'm not got sketchbook. Um, my, I can't remember my series log now. After I've, I've just been traveling, I've just got home, so I didn't have everything with me. Um, my pilot log line is, um, I believe it's, uh, following the, following the train accident, four teenage girls, uh, oh, I can't remember, I can talk about my head. 
But the idea of a series is that there is disabled people who have just become disabled uh, and they've got these extraterrestrial powers and that gives them superpowers, that's the idea. Um, but yeah, you'll have to come back to me next week to, for me to give you the sure. log lines and stuff. Yeah, no problem. Or if you if you find it or write it out before the end of class, you can post it in the assignments channel and get a little feedback if you want. Or if you think it's a little early, then you can just um, try to have that stuff ready for next week and try to just do, the, you know, the uh, um, a sketchbook is just a place to keep all your ideas in one location. So all your research and ideas for characters and locations and things like that. And then so try to have a, a series logline and a pilot logline and then just fill out as much as you can of the sketchbook, just collecting ideas and then try to read a full pilot script for yeah. next week. If you, if you want to be in the program and you're not just like following along for um, just to like audit the course, you can do that too. But um, if you actually want to write a pilot, try to um, start reading them once a week and just be ready to say, here's what I noticed or learned. Yeah. All right. So this, actually, I forgot to say that this pilot, I started writing ages ago. So actually, I'm, you know, not writing from scratch. I am halfway through Act 2 at the moment. Oh, okay. So yeah, I forgot to mention that. Sure, okay, so you're already in the middle of this one. That's okay. So you may not be following along exactly with the steps of the course. That's okay. Um, uh, but if you want to get good feedback, then try to, yeah, try to post the logline um, maybe by next week, and I can respond to it if you want. Um, and, or you can just wait yeah. a couple weeks for us to catch up to where you are, basically. Um, however you want to do it. Wonderful. Thanks, Joel. Cool. Um, Nacho, any update for us? You're still mostly working on this feature in the book, right? The feature we write and the... Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm not working. I'm just kind of sitting in today. That's all right. Thanks for that. Um, let's check with Paul. Yo. Uh, what's up? <laughs> Hi, Paul. How'd everything go with the pilot? Yeah, I am, uh... Uh, I'm still, I'm still, uh writing it i started writing it and i read a pilot script called uh it was on that website that nacho posted mm -hmm. uh it's called boo bitch but uh uh one thing i noticed is that there is a lot of talking in it and i and i really like that i was like okay so i don't have to feel bad about having the characters talk a lot uh, on a tv show yeah no tv shows have tons of talking on them yeah tv show tv is like 80 percent characters talking yeah, I was like, I was like, I don't, because, like, I see when, when, sometimes when people talk, uh, in the, in this group, like, about, like, not this, this boot camp or whatever, but the, they'll see a, a character is talking a lot in, like, a table read or something, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, there's just a lot of talking. I'm mm -hmm. like, yeah, but, like, <laughs> it matters what they're saying. A lot of TV shows are closer to plays than, or it's closer to playwriting than it is to cinematic writing. Writing a feature, features are more about people doing stuff, whereas TV shows, a lot of them, a lot of genres of TV are more about sort of social interaction, and so the major meat of those episodes are going to be people talking in rooms, and as such, dialogue is really important in TV, it's like more important than it is in movies, and also you can see why a lot of showrunners are looking for people to staff their rooms from the playwriting world. Um, like playwrights and stand-ups and things like that, they will try to get on TV staffs because dialogue is so important on TV, for sure. Good thing to notice, though. Um, and did you post your sketchbook and um, log lines in the chat? Or in the assignments channel? Mm -hmm. No, I haven't posted my uh, sketchbook and all that, but I can do that. If you want to. I mean, yeah, if you want to get feedback on it or want to make sure you're on the right track. Right. One one thing. Uh, um, I was wondering if you had like those. If you could send me the examples. Uh, the for the uh, scene cards that you had. Uh, um, sure. Yeah, I can do that. Because I want to know, like, like, what, what do you, what should go into each uh, paragraph? Like, like a baseline for yourself, right? Like, mm -hmm. when you're writing those paragraphs that the scenes are going to be based on. Yeah. What do you need to know? You know. You need to know where it's taking place, who's the main character, what are they trying to accomplish, what's standing in the way, what tactic do they use to try to overcome it, and what is the end result, and how do we transition to the next moment. Usually, you don't always have to include a transition. Often, I come up with good transitions while doing pages. But those are kind of the main five things. We can, And we're doing scene cards here next week, so we'll talk about that more then. 
But if you just want the quick answer, let me just give it to you one more time. One, location that the scene takes place in. Two, who is the main character of that scene, as in who is who are we following trying to accomplish a goal? What is their goal? What's standing in the way? What tactic do they use to try to overcome it? And what's the result? I guess that's six main things. Um, anyway, that's like the bare minimum. All right, thanks. Sure. And if you didn't get it, I can. We'll, we'll go over that more later. If you, if that was uh, just the, you know, I, if that went by way too quick. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I got those it. Are kind of essentials. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, thanks, Amanda. Made a little list. So location, uh, main character of scene. What is their goal? What stands in the way? What tactic do they use? What is the result? Yeah, that's the, that's the essentials. If you need to make a little checklist, that's what I would do. I don't normally make a full checklist like that each time just because those things sort of become very intuitive the more that you do this. But um, if you want to, if that helps you, then there, there you have it. Thanks, Amanda. Um, let's check with Roger. Oh, there we go. Hey, I read uh, the TV pilot for The Exorcist, which was a uh, really good, great lead character. And you kind of, you know... It, what I notice in good TV characters, they have like a quote unquote superpower and his power was, you know, he was compassionate and, and also very observant and sharp. And then I read uh, Dark Cargo, um, which was a very interesting pilot. The guy's a trucker and kind of a Twin Peaks vibe to it. Uh, again, good character and just know kept the surprises coming in both cases particularly in the exorcist had a really good twist at the end awesome yeah that was on was that on nbc for like two seasons in like 2018 like that kind of time yes that, that's the one right right i heard that was good i never saw it but it's in my like hulu queue um never yeah. watched it uh but the script was really good right yeah i heard that's one of those sort of underrated uh network shows that got canceled too early but um, definitely yeah, good to read that sort of thing. If because you're writing a sci-fi mystery fantasy horror kind of show like that, right? Yeah, definitely good yeah. to read the sort of genre that you are trying to write, especially stuff that hasn't been made or that you haven't seen, because then you just get the best sense of how the stuff works and looks on the page without being able to fill in the gaps of like, oh, I know what the actors look like, I know what those locations look like. It's often better to read stuff that you have not seen or that has that has remained unproduced. Oh, definitely. Um, and looks like you posted a sketchbook. Thank you for that. And your show was, remind me the title one more time. Goner, that's right. Okay. Cool. Looking forward to seeing more of that today. Thanks for the update, Roger. Okay. Um, so let's see where we are. Um, is that everybody? Did anyone not check in that needs to? No, that's everyone. Okay, great. So um, let's uh, let's get into this question here. Does anyone feel like they don't have a series and pilot log line totally done, or has questions about there still? Because this is we got to get this down before moving on to the uh, story beats today. So anyone feel like they still have questions on this? Oh great. Okay, cool. Everyone's got rock solid log lines. So um, let's look at the overview of the whole process here. Let me get out of the way first. So um, we go from logline to sketchbook to story beats. This is step three. And sketchbook is kind of something that you're doing continually the entire time. The sketchbook is never really done. It's not something you need to turn in necessarily if you don't want to, but some people just find it helpful if they want to get some kind of initial feedback on what they have there. So that's up to you, but the sketchbook is like a tool to use. It's not like a finished document that you will need to make perfect or make it super readable by anyone else. It doesn't really need to be unless you have collaborators, in which case it might be really helpful to make some things readable in it. But after Sketchbook, we are, you know, we're going to use that to collage all your ideas together and aggregate all of your inspiration and research and everything like that. And going into Story Beats is taking what you have in the Sketchbook and starting to shape it into the plot events. So we'll be doing all plotting today. Plotting being figuring out what happens in the show. I mean, it sounds super obvious. We're like, that's what writing is, is figuring out what happens, right? But there's many different elements of this that kind of work together to create a full cinematic story on the page. We have everything from, you know, designing that cast of characters, which should be in the sketchbook stage, but is super, super important before you kind of know what the characters are going to be doing in the show. Um, you got to do that beforehand. You got to make sure you know who your characters are before you start story beats. Um, and designing that cast 
is something that you should do in a strategic, methodical way, where you know what role each of those characters is going to play, and also we should know the kinds of conflicts that are going to be that are going to um, crop up between them, and um, who's going to hold the most story weight, like who gets the most screen time. So you kind of have to decide which characters I'm going to focus on. We can't focus evenly on all characters because we have so few pages to work with. You're working with either half an hour or one full hour of screen time. Within that, you in a half hour, you get about five scenes per act. That's like 15 total scenes, um, assuming they're going to average out to, you know, maybe some a little longer, maybe some a little shorter, but two minutes-ish per scene. You're going to end up with just a list of 15 scenes. That is not a lot of time to meet a full cast of people and to get a really full sense of what each of them want and everything. So we're going to have to decide very carefully who's going to get the most narrative weight, who gets the most scenes. Typically, it's going to be your protagonist gets the preponderance of scenes. Um, central relationship or villain often will be the second or you know maybe even tertiary kind of rank of just amount of screen time that characters will get. Um, so story beats will be organizing the events of the plot. Scene cards comes next. That's when you expand that list of story beats into a full paragraph for every scene. And then finally, in two weeks, we will go to pages, meaning you actually start writing the pages, formatting, organizing, and staging those scenes, and writing all the dialogue. You don't actually need to even download screenwriting software before we go to pages in step five. Any questions on this process before we move on? Okay, let's keep going. So um, I'm going to skip this slide. So structure, we'll talk structure. This is the organization of events in the story. This is the order that stuff occurs in and how it relates to the last thing and that happened and the thing that comes after it. Without a structure, a story is just a list of stuff occurring. Um, so some thoughts here. Don't try to fight this too much. Even if this feels restrictive to you or limiting in some way, just rest assured that it is not. And pretty much like the best TV shows of all time are all using some form of structure here. They are not trying to reinvent the entire system or the wheel or whatever this is to help you and it will help you finish the script which is ultimately the most important thing i always say there are only three things you really need to be doing you don't need to be taking classes or courses you don't need to be um you know uh in any writers groups or in any events or activities or anything like that you, you can if it helps you but the only things you need to do to improve and succeed as a tv writer are read pilots write pilots and finish stuff and move on those are the only things you actually really have to do. But sometimes it's tough to do those things unless we know this, the you know what to do before or how to go about those things. But just consider that by the time you get to the end of a script, you're going to have done so many rewrites on it that the page number benchmarks are not going to be as rigid. They're going to be shifted around, and it won't feel as maybe... Sometimes people feel like this will make the script feel formulaic or, or predictable. But if you're doing a good job, it will not. Um, you're not really super locked into the structure while writing it. You can always change things around as you go. Your logline and outline are going to serve as a compass to help you navigate to the end. Writing a pilot or anything really is kind of building a train, or writing a train that you have to build while it's in motion. The only way to get really good at this is to read pilots, write pilots, and move on to the next one. So let's look at the structure for um, a half hour pilot first. And these are going to be page numbers that you're seeing here. So we'll start with the cold open at two pages. Cold open, just a quick uh, explanation of that. That's like what we see before the opening credits. Often it is going to be introducing the main problem of the episode. Um, act one is 10 pages, and that is going to be where our introduction to the world. We meet the main character and learn who they are and what's missing in their life and what they want and what their goal is. Catalyst is going to be an event that shakes things up and causes your protagonist to have to react and change or adjust their life in some way they realize perhaps that a door has been unveiled to them and that uh, something interesting is on the other side it could be a job that you get it could be a relationship that starts it could be your, um you know almost anything it could be a big coincidence it could be a bus crashes into your house trying the locks is a very vastly misunderstood sequence but it's one of the most important in the entire script but this is where we are reacting to the catalyst and trying to figure out what to do now so uh, almost always the sequence will have a certain question at the core of it Usually that question is, what now? But often it can be something like, can this team work together? Or, um, you know, uh, what have I gotten myself into now? Or how bad is this going to get? Or is there still a way to fix this? Or things like that. Um, so the trying the lock sequence is going to be your main character is perhaps literally debating with other people. What do I do now that this catalyst has occurred? And how do I prepare for it? How do I go on this journey? Am I ready for this journey? Something like that. And we're just emphasizing how big of a deal it's going to be to finally go through that door, essentially, is the point of this sequence here. Until we break into two, and we um, usually go to commercial in half-hour shows. 
So I'll, you can imagine these as commercial breaks if that's helpful for you, and just usually they are in, in how TV works. Um, then Act 2 is going to be 10 pages, and after when, as we break into 2, we're going into the premise scenes. So that's exactly what you promised, exactly what the logline described. Midpoint is an es a substantial escalation of the stakes around halfway through the story, um, and it's followed by a sequence of escalation, which goes for a few more pages and ends in our break into 3. Escalation meaning we are deepening and broadening the stakes, we're making your main character's life harder, and they are struggling more and more as the antagonists increase their power or, you know, um, deal various strikes to your hero, and things that they care about start to become challenged or um, threatened. We're going to um, go into Act 3, heading for that AIL, which stands for All is Lost Moment. Sometimes in some half-hour shows, this is kind of a murky area between Acts 2 and 3, where sometimes it's like the end of Act 2 feels like All is Lost, and then our break into 3 right after there is sort of like your character's dragging themselves out of the pit of despair some shows are going to end a, at a, on a cliffhanger at the end of act two and then we're going to still be punishing the character up until that all is lost moment on page 24 or 25 um really just depends this is kind of like one of those murky areas that um is different depending on what year the show is coming out in and who's writing it and all kinds of things so um feel free to mess around a little bit with the transition from act two to act three in half hour um, but basically, this is followed by the Pit of Despair, which is the worst possible thing that could, your character can imagine has happened. And now things get even worse after that. Often this will be, maybe it could be a breakup or a big fight. In, a, in sitcoms, this is traditionally like the fight sequence, right? We have the fight with the, the husband or wife, and now your characters are off on their own, and they're realizing, wow, I shouldn't have done that. Now I need to learn my lesson and come back and apologize, and I was wrong because of this, and they're like, I was wrong because of this. And then we need to join forces for Act 3, which the, or for the finale here which is going to be just a sequence towards the end, maybe four or five pages at the very end where we confront the main goal that your main character was trying to address, or the main problem, the conflict they were trying to address this episode. Now that they are, um, now that they have kind of either learned the quote lesson or seen the dramatic argument of this episode, um, they have changed perhaps a little bit and need to now um, uh, learn something and show that they have learned that thing in this, in this finale. Or in some shows, sometimes they subvert that expectation on like, Always Sunny in Philadelphia or something like that, where the characters definitely don't learn the lesson that the world has been trying to teach them, and they approach the finale having doubled down on their terrible tactics from earlier. So something like that. There's not one way to do that. Um, but then usually we wrap things up, and in a status quo-based show, everything gets back to normal. So we have to sort of return to, to how things were at the beginning of the episode, or at least have the understanding at the very end that by the next episode, things would have returned to normal. Most cartoons get away with have a lot of leeway with this and don't really have to work way too hard to to convince us of that that things could get back to normal. Whereas live action shows, you might have a little more work to do. Procedurals also on the hour long end are going to be you have to return to normal by the end because we're going to have a new case or a new patient or a new crime next week. And then Stinger is going to be either during the credits or after the credits usually. And this in a comedy show is usually just the character, some of the fan favorite characters just hanging out and doing something funny. Or in, an, in a non-comedy show, usually this will be a preview of what's going to happen next time or some threat that has been unveiled that is going to be approaching for next week or basically whatever the next episode is going to focus on. So that's the basics there. Um, and I will stop to take questions on this after I break this down just a little more. Let's look at 60-minute pilot. And, um, well, here's a, here's a great diagram, actually, that shows you where everything kind of falls. This doesn't have the page numbers on it, but this just shows you the kind of um, the roller coaster here is being the in increase in stakes and tension until we finally get to the uh, the high point, which is the finale, and very quickly afterwards it falls off and we wrap up with the stinger. So TV shows, unlike movies, do they're not really complete stories. We have to leave room for, it feels like there's more in this world. There's either more story tarmac to kind of run on in terms of a, a premise-based show that's like a long movie. It's like a, we've only watched the first chapter of a much longer story and then um even in a status quo show you have to imply there are many more stories in this world or there, there, this isn't the one thing that could possibly happen here we need to give us a setup where we can can sort of um think that if we return next week there will be another story that's like this and with these same characters and using the same sort of toolbox but it's going to follow some other issue or it's going to follow another situation that's along the lines of the conflicts in the first one so TV doesn't really feel like it's definitively ending. Your episode should have a strong beginning, middle, and end, um, and maybe a preview of what's coming next, or it should feel like, especially in a premise show, there's much more to do. 
There's much longer to go. It shouldn't feel like it's all resolved and over at the end. You have to leave some threads strategically hanging in order for this to feel like a show. Otherwise, it's just going to feel like a short film. Um, so, 60-minute pilot. Let's look at the uh, structure for this one. It's pretty much the same, um, but the some of these benchmarks are just obviously moved around a little bit because you have twice as much space. The acts are going to be 12 pages instead of 10 pages. We have a little longer for Cold Open and Stinger. And premise scenes are su quite substantial. Um, premise scenes are going to be, you know, basically all of Act 2 and into Act 3. So this is divided into five acts, as you can see. You're pretty much still going to consider this a, for the for story purposes, five acts is still kind of three acts if you just, you know, cut the segments a little bit differently. So um, five acts, this is pretty much the only time that we talk in terms of five acts outside of, I don't know, Shakespeare. Um, so don't let that confuse you. It still is going to be a beginning, a middle, and an end. A setup, confrontation, and finale and resolution. That's the three parts of a story, whether it's an hour long or half hour. It doesn't matter how long it is. So the, the page lengths are slightly different here. We have longer to do everything, but um, still we should be engaging with the main premise of your episode, or of the show, basically by Act 2 is when we should pretty much get into that, or at least be heading in that direction. Acts 2 and 3 should contain what it says in your logline. That's usually what we mean by premise scenes. It's taking advantage of your premise by, you know, it takes us down the journey that you've outlined in that logline. Your midpoint in this one, the end of Act 3 makes a great midpoint, and you should think in terms of, quote, cliffhanger for all act breaks in TV, because imagine that the commercial comes on right after. The audience needs to be so invested that they will not go on their phone, they will not change the channel, and they will not go find something else to watch. There's a lot of really great stuff out on every streaming service at this point. They have a million things to choose from. You have to really make a strong argument as to why they should come back at the commercial break for your show. So don't neglect the act breaks, especially in hour-long TV. You have five of them, so you should be like more careful with how you use them. Or uh, not five of them, you have four of them, I guess, if we start with uh, Act 1. Then you have the break into two, break into three, break into four, and break into five. So you have four act breaks to deal with. Make sure that they are convincing and compelling to the audience enough that we say, oh, I have to come back after this. Try not to create the sense of false cliffhanger. Um, can you guys think of what I mean by a false cliffhanger? Or how would that look in a story? Maybe you've seen examples of this before. I, I have one, an example. Go ahead. Because I wrote it. Um, I did a... Uh, TV pilot is called the do-over and the man, uh, man dies and gets a chance to do over his life. Um, before I killed him, I pretend kill him. You talked pretend, about. Pretend kill him. Um, he got, almost got hit by a car and that's how I introduced his sister, but because they know it was going to be a do-over and they knew he was going to die, that became a false. Oh, I see. So you mean it? you sort of led the audience to believe that there was some danger, but then it quickly re was revealed that there was not, in fact, that danger? Uh, he ended up in the hospital, but he didn't die. But they knew that because he was supposed to die, it was going to be a do-over, that it ended up being a false cliffhanger because they, they knew he was going to die, but he didn't die that time. Okay. Right. So, yeah, that's, that's often the form that these are going to take. It's going to be like, we pretend like there's danger, but then very quickly afterwards we realize, that, oh, the stakes weren't really there. Or you might imagine if the character is literally hanging off a cliff, then we have them let go, and then we cut to commercial, and then we come back at the end of the commercial, we see, oh, there wasn't really a cliff. There, there was a mattress right underneath them. They were fine. Then that sometimes feels unsatisfying. Or if um, we do this thing, there's this kind of annoying form of cliffhanger also where, you know, the character will be going towards the door, and then they'll open it, and then we'll cut to commercial, and then when we come back from commercial, we see, oh, what is it? Oh, it was this. Uh, okay, well, that wasn't that big a deal. So we just sort of pretended like it could have been something worse than it actually was. Uh, so it's better to, as um, uh, Brandon Sanderson has given this tip before on his writing um, classes, when it's better to open the door and see what's on the other side and then cut to commercial rather than open the door and then cut to commercial. Um, it just gets annoying for the audience to always feel like they're being teased like that. It's more interesting for us if we show something fascinating or we ask what are the implications of that going to be rather than asking wait what is it what happens what are the implications is better than wait what was it um i hope that makes sense but try to make these each of these acts needs to end with something compelling interesting and that pulls us through to the next act that makes us say oh i've got to turn the page 
whether that is going to be life and death cliffhanger or not, it's got to be something. Okay, um, let me just take preliminary questions on this. I can go more into detail on each of these sec uh, st structural beats if you guys need. But let me just check if there's any just broader questions that you guys have first before I do that. I had one question. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll get to it later, but just about like a B story. Because I, I taking this to be this is like the protagonist story, the main beats, but I was wondering how you integrate, when and how you integrate a B story. That's a good question, and um, some pilots have a C story, or even a D, depending on the complexity. Um, I've never really seen a D story in a half hour pilot, but I'm sure that they, some people have, some madmen have attempted it before. Um, this is an advanced tactic, and or and sort of a little bit more of an advanced topic. It's a, it's a good question, and it's very valid in TV. Normally, I will give you the suggestion that by sticking to the, writing out the A story first, the best places to bring in the B and C stories will fall into place. Um, that won't always, always happen, but really definitely plot the A story first and make sure that the B and C stories are, like, supporting that A story and that they are existing, like, to um, propel and amplify the A story and they're blossoming off from it. They're, they don't feel like complete digressions from the A story. They feel like more natural and organic, uh, like offshoots of it that return and intersect in fascinating ways throughout the show um we will definitely get to this more um i think i may need to do a few slides on this um total i i, I will just give you the main tip though write the a story first and then it, it will become much clearer where everything else goes when you say write the a story you mean the scene cards or the actual script oh um i mean when, when we're just plotting so when we're just figuring out what happens so we're in this stage we're in the stage of figuring out story beats just look at your main character and figure out what they're doing and how their story is advancing and what obstacles they're coming up against and how they're getting over those things. And then usually by just figuring out, you will be forced to figure out where the B and C stories go. Um, not, and if, if not, then we will be able to flesh that out more in the, in the next week, but um, definitely get that a story down first, the main character, central protagonist act like they're the only person in the world and then figure out sort of what needs to happen in just their story. Once that's in place, it becomes much easier to figure out everything else. Cool. Thank you. But good question. I actually need more slides on this. But the thing is, um, uh, I guess this is it, it just strikes me as one of those slightly more advanced topics that people who are writing their first or second pilots rarely even kind of have fully have the tools to start tackling yet. It, it, is a, it is a great topic to go into. I just haven't found... I've often found in TV boot camps, we have to focus on the just the basics of get the episode done, write the A story before we worry about intertwining subplots. But I think that we should start focusing on this more in classes, especially now that we have people that have been through multiple pilot boot camps before. So good, good note. I will actually make a note to look at that a lot more and to talk more about subplots in weeks two and three of the class. So thanks for um, bringing that to my attention for sure. Um... Other questions on just broad elements of structure before we get down to the more nitty gritty part? Can you guys all read this? Or do you need, I can, we can link to the uh, slideshow as well. So if you need to review any of this, I've just pasted the link to the slideshow in the chat that you can access anytime. Okay, so um, let's go... Oh, here's the full diagram of what this looks like in the show. All right, um, let's talk more in detail about each piece. Um, and I want to spend maybe like 15 to 20 minutes on this at most. If you've heard all this structure stuff before and you want to take a 15-minute coffee break, you can do that. But if you're still learning about structure, still trying to figure out what this looks like in TV... I recommend you just start to try to memorize these things like and know this like the back of your hand, especially if you want to work in writer's rooms where you will be expected to speak in these terms and have a very, very clear understanding of TV structure. No one's going to teach it to you on the job. You're not getting that job unless you have a fantastic understanding of structure. So try to learn this stuff. I would, I would highly recommend. Very few TV writers succeed by just making it up as they go. Um, you really have to have a good idea of where things go and what the role of each of these moments is supposed to be. So we'll start with cold open. So I think we've all seen cold opens before. This is the first few pages of a pilot script. It's going to often be a scene that teases what is going to happen or suggests the tone of the show or gives us a hint as to what this episode is going to be about. Maybe this is even the first 
and often this will be like the event that precedes everything. So in crime procedurals, we see this all the time. At the cold open in a CSI episode is going to be someone gets murdered. Uh, in a monster of the week type show, this is going to be, well, a monster eats somebody. And then once we go into the, the meat of the episode, we're going to follow monster hunters or detectives or whatever as they try to piece together what happened and why. We call this cold because there's nothing setting it up. This is just what... The, it's the very first thing we see without even a title sequence to tell us what this is going to be. Um, sometimes this is called a teaser. And this works for drama, comedy. Every genre has versions of this. Um, and you don't have to have one. You absolutely do not need to have a cold open. But people like them, and they're a good opportunity to sort of show off like what the tone of this is. A little preview of what we're about to get into and to really hook us and say the, the rest of this is going to be worth your time to read. Questions on cold open? So remember how many pages you get for this. You get in a half hour, you get like one or two pages. In a 60 minute, you get about three pages max for this. Try not to make the cold open go more than three pages. No questions on that. Um, so sometimes this is going to look like a little standalone scene of some kind that will set up the world and introduce series characters or something like that. This is very rare to see, but occasionally there's some version of a cold open that uh, is kind of unrelated to the story of the pilot. Um, more often, though, this is going to set up the story of the pilot. This is going to be either that first essential thing happening, like the murder occurring or the monster eating the guy. Um, or this is going to be... A, sometimes you, you would see this thing where it's going to tease something that's going to happen later in the episode... It's going to be like, here's the exciting thing. And just trying to get the reader excited about who the characters are, how they possibly got to this situation, and then we flash back to three weeks earlier. Well, let me recommend you not do this, because this has been done to death. Thanks to Breaking Bad, and um, a, even Battlestar Galactica had a couple episodes like this at the kind of height of that era. Um, and uh, what's the other big show that totally made everybody do this for a while? I think Breaking Bad may have been the one that like really made everyone do this for a while. You start with something cool and exciting, and then we cut, and it's over, and we flash back to how did we get there. Just probably don't do that unless you have some absolutely brilliant reason for doing that or some essential thing that you're doing there. Like, just understand that this is played out, and unless you do it in a new, brilliant way, then you're going to get docked a few points. Um, just probably pick a teaser or cold open that sets up the story of the episode and just pushes things into motion. It's like the first key events occurring. Um, but basically just want to hook the reader. I don't want to talk more, much more about cold open. Uh, okay, so... Oh, am I in lockdowns after this? Okay, so after um, cold open, we have intro. That's going to be the sort of normal world that your main character lives in all the time. We sort of understand how it works or how it's supposed to work or see it working as intended. We want to see what's missing, though. What does your character want? They're in a kind of stasis, usually, until something happens. A catalyst that shakes things up and says you're now forced to act. You're forced to respond because we've set the events of the story in motion and pushed the character out of that stasis and moved us towards the premise of that episode. This is like a sort of call to adventure of some kind, but it's only one single moment. Don't make A catalyst is not a series of events. A catalyst is one thing happening. I would, I would write down that if you're, not, if you're still figuring out how a structure should look. Some of these things are just one moment, and some of these things are a sequence of moments. Um, intro is a, sequen is a short sequence. Catalyst is just one thing happening. Trying the locks is a short sequence. A, an act break is just one thing. Um, so uh, Catalyst I mean, it moves us towards the event. This could be as simple as, you know, in your sitcom. Uh, this might be that, um, you know, we found out we have a roach infestation in our house. And then you're trying the locks might be, God, now what do we do? Can we just squash them all? And your main characters just try to run around squashing them. But it's not working. We need to call pest exterminators. So they call three different pest exterminators, right? We're trying various stuff to solve this problem as we're trying to settle on a course of action. And this can be super fun. Often, if the uh, if the main character is um, going to what what was well, I just I just lose my train of thought on this. We're going from trying the locks to breaking the two. I totally lost my train of thought on that sentence. Sorry about that. Um, somebody tagged me in the chat. Can I put cold opens in some episodes and not others? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, in theory, you can, but I can never. I can't really think of a reason to write more than one episode of a show unless you are writing a web series. Then. If you're trying to be a professional TV writer, you only write the pilot. Um, nobody will read more than one episode of a show. No prospective buyers will. No prospective managers will. 
you've got to just write a pilot and focus on that. So we're almost never writing more than just the pilot, unless you're making the whole thing yourself like a web series, in which case, yeah, you can do whatever you want. Thanks for the question. Um, where were we? So, uh, trying the locks is going to be, yeah, your character's trying out the sort of superpowers or learning the rules of the world, or maybe they're, you know, they're calling pest exterminators to deal with the roach problem. Our break into two is where your characters are usually going to settle on a course of action, and we're going to see this is going to be difficult, but we have a plan in, in mind, um, and we're going to go through a certain doorway where we can't go back, so that means we're going to embark on the journey of the episode. So, and try to remember cliffhanger or some kind of thing that just says, this is going to be real interesting. You should definitely come back after the commercial is done. All right, premise scenes. That's going to be the uh, section of the story where you just cut loose and give us the fun thing that you promised. So whatever it says in the logline is typically what we should be doing in premise scenes. So use the moments that you envisioned in the trailer. This is the primary action of the story. Just have fun here. Um, if you're not having fun, we will not be having fun. But utilize your premise here. This should feel like the, log the show that the logline described. The midpoint is going to, in our long structure, be a really nice end of your act three. But that's going to be an escalation of stakes and escalation of danger. Sometimes it can be a twist, like maybe if in the first half of the episode we were trying to catch a criminal, the, the, the midpoint might be we realize we got the wrong guy, the killer's still out there. Um, or something along those lines. Um, it looks like my slide is a little misaligned there okay um and uh your main character should basically just realize how difficult their task has either gotten or how maybe they failed at the first part and they realize oh god this is going to get way worse or maybe this could be we realize we had a sort of false victory to begin with and the true journey is going to be much more challenging after this the midpoint clarifies that things are about to get tougher escalation is what immediately follows and that section says the fun, the fun is over, and we're now going to see the consequences of the midpoint. And whatever happened in the premise scenes, the, the birds are going to come home to roost, so to speak. So the antagonist is going to regroup and um, try another you know, attempt to ruin your character's life. Their life is going to get harder as various costs are exacted on your main character in terms of things they care about. That might be their physical health, that might be their mental health, that will almost always in TV be centered on relationships. So this is going to be where you start getting in a fight with the significant other, or the friends, or things like that. Um, all is lost is where it's going to seem like your, your your character will either lose at their goal or seem as if they are on the verge of losing at it. This will often be the worst outcome they could imagine. And in movies or in stories with a central relationship, like a buddy story, like a best friend story, like a buddy cop, like cop partner story, or like a romance type of thing, this will be a breakup or fight between them pretty often. Um, not always, but very often. And then that brings us to the pit of despair, which the main character now needs to live in the consequences of that all is lost and now that they have they seem they're farther than their goal from their goal than ever they're at their absolute lowest point in terms of your genre it doesn't mean they have to be like you know on the verge of death in a sitcom at their lowest point might just mean you got in a fight with your wife and now you're sad and sleeping on the couch right that could be the worst lowest point in a sitcom um but uh often someone dies or is gravely injured that i should take that out of the slide but the um you know in in action-adventure type stories, maybe this is going to be the death of an important character. Um, you know, the death of a mentor figure or the death of somebody that really matters to your hero. You don't always have to kill people in TV, and it, it can be troublesome to do so because you need to keep your characters around to have multiple seasons of a show. So don't feel the need to kill a character, but this is just, you know, things have gotten even worse. Your character's at rock bottom for your genre. Until we reach this sort of break into three moment, which don't don't get confused because I know we said we have five acts on an hour long show, but just imagine this: the break into the final third of the of the pilot. Um, this is traditionally in a sitcom. This is going to be where they come back together. They're like, "I'm so sad. I was wrong because of this," and the other person says, "I was wrong because of this." And now that we realize the lesson, like I guess we both should have just been more patient, essentially. And now, with that new sense of patience, we're going to go into the finale using that tool now that um, we have gained that tool in order to take one last swing at the problem and either succeed or fail at the main goal of that episode. Um, and this is going to lead to some kind of grand finale, which could be a big in an action adventure show. This will be a final battle of some kind. In a, uh, a comedy, this could be almost anything, but this is going to be you know, a confrontation between the hero and the villain or the protagonist and the antagonist in the most difficult version of this so far that we've seen that tops everything else that um, has led up to this point, so the biggest battle of all so far, and your main character either wins or they lose, and then they uh, either reset back to how things were 
at the beginning. So we, you know, return to the, the Simpsons, get back on the couch at the end of the episode or whatever. Or this is going to be, we sort of have to see where they end up in a more premise-based show. We're going to start, we're going to lay the pieces in place so that we can understand, okay, this is the direction and the trajectory that the show is taking. And we can sort of see what's going to happen in the coming weeks or maybe even coming years of this. We've put the, we've put the pieces in motion for a longer story and we've definitively finished the first chapter of it, but there's much more to go. And the stinger is going to reinforce that by saying, here's a preview of what's going to happen next time, you know, in the action adventure type format. Often this will be the, you know, we may have beaten the lieutenant, but he goes back to his boss and he's like, boss, the heroes beat me. What do we do? And the villain's like, well, next time we'll send my biggest goblin of all at them. Ha ha ha. Cut to black, right? Because we're suggesting what's going to happen next week. It's going to be escalating from here. And we're going to be basically saying, oh, I can't wait to watch the next episode. In a status quo show, you should focus more on a satisfying resolution and the feeling that there are many more stories like this that could take place in this world. Don't really focus on setting stuff up for the future of a status quo show. Focus more on resolving what you have. And then that, yeah, that stinger is just going to be a, um, just a page or two usually. And that's going to be often in comedy, they play the credits over top of the stinger. In some shows, they might have a post credit scene, but not very often. Okay, that's the major structural beats of a TV episode. Let's stop for questions. Everyone feels good about this? Great, okay, we'll move on then. Um, so don't worry about the season map. Remember, we're not really writing uh, more than just a pilot. So common issues before you even start, just in terms of story beats, we'll look at story beats. We can tell some of these things might be problems. Overambitious. So too many characters, too many plot points, too much ground covered. Remember that a movie is like a short story and a pilot is less than half the length of most movies. So this is like a short, short story. Um, you can't cover too much, and especially in half hour, you only have about 15 scenes. There's not a ton you can do, so don't be overambitious, don't add too much stuff. Your conflict might seem like it's too internal and doesn't really lend itself to interesting scenes. Like if it's just about someone sitting around thinking about stuff, or people just sitting around discussing um, stuff, rather than, you know, uh, trying to accomplish a goal, or debating stuff and trying to prove their point. Like, I, I understand that there, like I even mentioned earlier in the class, there's a lot of talking in TV, but it should still feel like we're watching characters pursue goals, not just sit around and discuss things. Um, too much world building it comes up a lot. Your world might be too complicated for a spec pilot to fully delve into, or you've gone into too much detail in trying to figure out how the world works and trying to show showcase and give us a tour of the entire thing without actually giving us that central strong A story that we want to really attach to and follow that main character there. Um, movies and pilots are more like short stories than anything else. Um, so try not to give us a massive world that we have to learn a bunch of rules, especially in half hour. Biggest issue though, the story just doesn't get going fast enough. And every boot camp we have a few folks that are like, oh, well, I'm just gonna write like uh, up to the point where it seems like the log line would kick in and the log line would describe the story of episodes two to the end. That's a huge mistake. The log line needs to describe the pilot. And you have a pilot and a series log line separately, it's true, but the first episode needs to be a showcase of the kinds of things that we're going to be doing in the rest of the show. The first episode is like a trailer for your show. It's like, this is the reason why you should stick around. And if you save all the good stuff for episodes that you're not even going to write, then you haven't put your best foot forward and front-loaded the pilot with the best stuff. You need to put the best stuff here because you're not going to write more episodes. So if there's like a villain that you really want to use, but you keep him in the shadows and in the distance the whole pilot, we're just never going to get to see that character. So... Give us the good stuff in the first episode, for sure. Um, here's just a bunch of other suggestions from a Blacklist reader based on... Um, these are based on reading movies for the Blacklist, but this is this can be the case with many of these with pilots as well. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go over all of these just because it would take a while to, but um, a bunch of just important things here. Um, things like the important story material is told or discussed and not shown. That's a big one where the characters will just talk about stuff and we won't actually have them up and going around the world interacting with things and doing stuff 
we want to watch characters um, moving around and, and, you know, interacting and uh, doing stuff in the world. I, I know I've just said that a couple times, but the base, the, that's the basis of it. We, unless your show is like a courtroom drama or something like that where the conversations and the dialogue that is representing people doing super important stuff, and certainly shows have a lot of dialogue, but still consider where can these scenes take place? What can they be doing at the same time at this di- as this dialogue scene? Can they be doing something interesting while they're talking? Or can they be trying to accomplish something while they're talking rather than just, now they're talking in this room. Now they're talking in this room. Um, mix up your locations and put them in different scenarios. Um, and uh, it will suggest interesting options for those scenes. If you have just a conversation scene, imagine how might it be different if the characters can barely hear each other. Um, would they have to yell to, to make their point heard? Or will they have to, you know, maybe they're in a library and they have to whisper the conversation. Or maybe they have a conversation while they're being held at gunpoint, so they have to be careful what they reveal. Like, there's all kinds of interesting ways you can spin scenes to just make them more fascinating to us. Um, other stuff, uh, don't worry about memorizing these or anything like that, but we can just take a quick look at some of these other major problems here. Um, the story unfolds via contrivances and coincidences. This is a big one. So coincidences that create problems are good. Co- coincidences that solve problems uh, feel like cheating to the reader a lot of the time, especially like this Deus Ex Machina thing where the good guys come in at the last second to save your hero due to just because the author wanted them to. If the hand of the author becomes too apparent, that's what we say to indicate that it feels like things are being forced into place. If they're not happening organically or they're not being motivated properly. So um, try to make sure that everything feels like it would happen in this world. It's not like we're the author stepping in to just shove things where they need to go. And then lulls and repetition can happen in especially a saggy middle. Um, this is where your whole cake can collapse if you're not careful, but it just feels like we're doing the same thing or a version of the same thing again and again in the middle of the story. This one comes up a lot in Acts 2 and 3 of hour-long shows where people are like, well, I don't know if I can think of enough scenes to make this interesting, so we'll just do the same sort of thing for a while. We'll just do five fight scenes in a row. I don't know. Um, Everything else here is important to look at as well, but uh, that's just sort of some of the main things here. Um, The ending is important. The ending should feel climactic and like the culmination of everything we've seen so far. It shouldn't feel like we just ended things or we just um, decided to call it a day. It should feel like things are resolved, but with some elements strategically unresolved. Like maybe we've defeated the first villain from this team, but there's way more to go. Or maybe we've we've taken in one criminal, but we understand next week there will be another case just like it. Or maybe we just had a problem in our family and we've resolved it, and next week maybe something else will come up, but the family will still be together to deal with it next week. Something like that. Okay, um, so instead of looking at the knowledge, because that's a movie, I'd like to look at story beats for, one of, for the pilot that I just plotted out last night today. Um, and I also wanted to check to see if anybody wants review of their sketchbook or early story materials of any kind. Does anyone want to do that before we move on? Does anyone need uh, feedback or suggestions just based on what they have? So to look at our sketchbooks, in other words? If you need it, if you have any questions unresolved in the sketchbook or any problems or things that you want to just get I just wonder if I have any good pacing because I'm kind of, I've kind of just been like vomit drafting the uh, scene by scene. In terms of just plotting out the scenes or you mean you've already yeah. started pages? No, no. As far as plotting out the scenes, I feel like I'm just retreading my first version of this beat for uh, scene for scene except instead of cutting to other side characters i'm skipping that and now it just feels like there's missing meat you know okay do you want feedback do you want me to look at that now yeah okay so um this is space dog sci-fi action adventure a lazy pilot riddled with daddy issues wishes to build a star fleet to avenge his father against the will of his planet's military to destroy an enemy satellite base. Okay. You mean the military doesn't want him to just destroy the base, or they don't want him to build They don't the want him to do it all, go, go all, like, rogue hero type thing, go all, like, uh, what's the word? Like, uh, rogue hero, like, uh, vigilante. Okay, I see. So they don't want him to break off from his main I navy. Know. I see. Okay, I think I get it. Uh, Let's, um, oh, that's right. They're animal people, too. <laughs> I forgot about that. 
uh, so all the characters are various animals, right? And this, yes. like, sort of like Bojack Horseman, or in the sense yeah, of these kind are of, of, except, except nobody's, except everybody's still technically just human in this way. Well, so, like, could two dog people give birth to a cat person? Uh, no, I don't really know if I want to go into the details of that. Sure, fair enough, but I guess that's just the difference between are these are are they like actually distinct alien races or are is this just like a stylistic way of representing different human characters? It's a stylistic way. Okay, all right, that that makes sense. We see some of that. We mostly see. see I've been like in the cartoon show Arthur, except this is not ch ch a children's show. <laughs> okay, right, right. Um, yeah, we normally see this in animation. Um, I am not even sure if you could do this in live it action. Is anim it will be animated. This is intended to be a sort of animation style. I see. Okay. Um, great. So let's look at the story beats, or what, whatever you have. Um, you're a little bit ahead if you have story beats already, but I can give some early feedback on these. So where am I going to look on this page? Is this it? Just this list of scenes here? Yeah, plot pilot. Yeah, it's just scene for scene. Okay, so these are just ideas for, for scenes, basically. Got it. Um, so uh, is it that you are not sure where the different acts would go or are you just these are just ideas right you're trying to yeah I'll okay. tell where the acts go okay. kind of let's take a look so um here we go kind of like you're just jumping from plot point to plot point sure much of a sense of uh what, you know, a sense of meat to it okay so we open on a cool fight scene with sleek space planes outnumbered and taking on a fleet of bandits. The crew of the original Space Dogs fly their planes like experts in banter throughout. The bandits call the Space Dogs warmongers. The crew banters, Belling and Hog bicker like rivals. Hog seems pretty greedy. Boss pilot dog extraordinaire John tells his crew to shut it as there is an enemy base nearby. Okay, is John your main character? No, he's the main character's father. Okay. Who's the... It's going to be called opening. This is sort of like a cold open that gives you a sense of... This is the idea of the cold open, where it's like you're going to see lots of these sorts of cool fight scenes in space and on planets where people are shooting lasers. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's a good way to think of this. But... And the cold open makes you think, wow, these guys are awesome. These guys kick ass. Wait, they're dead? Oh, they're Now dead. you want to see them avenged because they were so cool. Where are they dead? Is that in the next scene? Later on. Later on, okay. Well, not dead, but dispersed. Okay. So we cut to Pulley and his roommate, Gek, who are sitting around the dorm. Gek is neat, Pulley is lazy and a drinker. So Pulley is your main, is the yep. central protagonist here. Okay. Gek urges Pulley to focus and stop daydreaming of being in the space dogs and start working towards it. There's a room over an asteroid base for enemy planet in orbit around an enemy planet, I guess? Something like that? No, in orbit around theirs. Okay. You can find it. There's a rumor. So in, normally, uh, it's going to be better of, instead of just there's a rumor, we see like some direct effect that that thing has. So it's like, um, well, I'm not sure if this is your catalyst or not, but um, it's hard to dra dramatize a rumor. It's easy to dramatize, oh, we see the enemy space base shoots a laser and blows up something important, right? So that's, those just usually lead to stronger... In inciting incidents in the first couple acts. So yeah. his, his father calls by hologram, annoyed by a failed exam. They bicker, and John and Pulley almost get heated, but Snow interrupts them. Gek and Pulley continue to argue, and Pulley calls Gek pathetic for pining after the broken, depressed instructor. Pulley reminds his friend to have standards and swears he's the best. Okay, so he's kind of a hot-headed, cocky guy who thinks he's the best but doesn't actually work for it, is what we're seeing. That's his flaw and problem. So we go to a simulation flight. Um, an amazing pilot shows grace and expertise. We think it's Pulley, but it's actually his bully, Skea. Um, as she returns to the crowd, she picks on Gek, and Gek makes notes of Skea's roommate Katrina and her overuse of makeup. Okay. Pulley steps in and promises to fight the bully later. A direct cut to the two. Looks like the perfume, because she smells of it. Okay. A direct cut to the two still in an angry stare in an abandoned bunker, and they kiss. Pulley decide and they do more than that. Pulley decides to go public with the relationship. This is the bully that he Skaya? What? Who who is he kissing? Yeah, it's with Skaya. It's like they they it's like secret a secret relation. Oh, okay. So he's 
okay, so he's secretly in a relationship with the bully. Um, he decides to go public with the relationship, not caring about the status, class, or expectations. They walk back in silence. Which but... that should be want to. Oh, they okay, I see. But the grand leader, Major Salt, calls him to his office. He comes across as kind and caring, but stoic. There's something in his words that high bloodthirst. He mentions cameras in the abandoned bunker have found them doing dot 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 to each other. He says the camera is faulty and therefore he can delete the data, but begs them not to do it again. He holds a high-tech zip drive in his hand after they leave. Okay, maybe like a recording? Days later, Pulley walks into yeah, the like room. I was like a zip drive mm -hmm. or something more digital than uh, what we would have today because this is a future world. I see. Um, so he walks to his room. They talk about how their new spot will have to do. They kiss again, but Gek catches wind, and Kat also is there saying she knew for months. Gek says the major has called them, and he says we found another place for privacy. Gek is mad that he's been uh, hooking up with the bully and slams the door in, his, in a rage. Back in the office, Kat, Skea, and Pulley find Jermaine and Salt. Salt is grim-toned and tells the four to sit. Um... Wait, it starts with peaceful, tense negotiations. This is the space dogs in a fight versus their rival crew, Star Horse. It starts with peaceful negotiations, but it ends with a space dog opening fire, and a battle begins. Okay, so this is like a skirmish between other training pilots, and they start to fight for real? No, this is like, uh, look at this video that we caught. For, this is what our drones caught news of. Okay. Hog is being blamed, but Hog is not heard. He shoots down a space dog, a swing, and it's John's. The video cuts off after that. Scott says the funeral will be in a few days. He notes how close the people are to those who fell. Okay, so Pulley is sad in bed because some of his friends died in that battle. He makes up with his friend Gek. They see a space dog ship hurtling through space towards his planet. And we go into a montage where he was respected and nobody cares about him now that his father's declared dead. Where did that happen? When he got shot down in that video. Is it mentioned in this? It doesn't, is this, is that on the page here? That, oh, is th that's this part saying it's John's, John is his dad? Yep. Okay, super important detail there. It's gonna be a big scene to the, when the character loses his father right so i just kind of lost it in the um there we go it's police father super important to emphasize so then he's yeah has to react and respond to that which looks like he does here um so we see a space dog so ship hurtling towards the planet he reflects on how he used to be respected but now that his father's dead he's got to do something different he focuses on his academy work and fails to impress. We do the funeral of the dad. Okay. Um, and then that's where we kind of end up. Okay, so how far are we into the show at the end of this? I have no idea. That's what I'm trying to figure out if it's going, if this, that's what I mean by if the pace is too hot, fast, too slow. I haven't written this version yet, but I have no clue. I don't know how long this will be. Okay. Or, Awesome. Well, yeah, it's hard to evaluate pacing if we don't have if we don't have a sense of how long each of these moments is going to take and how it's going to fit into the structure. So I think what you should do is make a just make a list of the structure right here. So write out each thing and then start filling in like drag and drop each of these sections here under which of these parts of the story you think you have figured it out already. So we have intro, catalyst, uh, we have trying locks, we have um, act brick break into two then we have premise scenes you can just fill the rest of this out with the page numbers next to it and then you're going to start to get a sense of do i have enough in each section um it sounds like you're going about to the end of act two in this so you're not quite even halfway through this one yet um i think the pacing could be fine but um there's quite a lot happening on the space station before we get into the the father being killed in the battle isn't there there's like six or seven scenes maybe that would make a nice end of your first act um, each of the acts, remember, we're trying to find some dramatic thing that compels the audience to come back afterwards. So try to angle your act break so that we're ending on those cliffhangers. Um, yeah, and fill this out as best you can and check back with me by the end of class and I can take another look and give you an some more pointers about pacing if you need. All right. But it seems good so far. You've got a good cast, um, lots of different relationships here. 
I didn't expect the plot line of him hooking up with this bully, so there's uh, something there that could be some fascinating drama as we go forward. Um, yeah, I think you've got a lot of strong elements here. Just fill out the structure, and then it, we can't really evaluate pacing until you do that. Got it. Thanks, Dan. And you can delete all my... These are all just suggestions, so if you need to delete that, you can. All right. Does anyone have any questions or comments based on just what we've been talking about and how we've been evaluating these things so far or anything else about structure does anyone else want to do this like going over stuff in their sketchbook and trying to figure out how to shape it into a story or does everyone feel like they can uh, i'd like a quick look okay sure possible mm -hmm. uh let's look in the chat what's the name of it donner Oh, it's a docs link. Okay, I got it. All right. So, where should I start here? Uh, if you scroll down, there are the. It's just broken into like beginning, middle, finale, the okay. bottom of the document. Right here on page five. Blockbuster moments. Yes. Okay. Um, so, it, this is just like a list of events in the be beginning, middle, and end. I see. All right, so Larkin, our main character, she's a religious thief. She prays, giving 10% tithing to the church. It's a nice chunk of change. Okay, so Larkin, a thief, burg burglarizes someplace. A, cop, a mark or cop chases her to an abandoned police precinct. Detective Treggs, this, that's right. So the premise of this show, for those who do not yet know, this is about a thief who gets possessed by the ghost of a detective who needs to now hunt down his murderers in order to put his soul at rest and get rid of him. Would you say that's correct? He's a fifth. I mean, this was a detective active in the seventies. Okay. Um. Cool. So, uh, third scene is going to be um. She gets possessed by him. Larkin experiences strange hallucinations and behavior. Certainly, she by hallucinations and behavior you mean she's seeing a detective from the seventies talking to her, right? Uh, I was actually thinking more like seeing things that he remembers. Oh, okay. So she's not quite sure what's happened yet, and it sort yeah, of yeah. That's that's what I was thinking. I don't want to overcomplicate it, so I'm open to direction of like, no, but I was hoping to hold off on seeing the detective, and maybe you could think it's de demonic possession, something a little more really yeah. sinister, you know? Yeah, I'm with you. I think for a comedy, we'd want to make the detective show up right away, but this since this is a serious tone, you probably have the right idea here. This is supposed to be scary, right? Certainly dark. I mean. Possessions and scary serial killers nice. and cults and murders. Yeah, I mean, that's scary stuff for most people, I would say. <laughs> oh, that's pedestrian to me. No, it <laughs> yeah. totally is. Scary. I mean, we, we do get desensitized to writing this kind of stuff after a while. We kind of, I mean, I wrote on Creep Show, believe me, I get it. But um, uh, yeah, okay, let's look at, uh, so this is looking good so far. So Larkin seeks diagnosis. Is it a brain tumor? Yeah, this will be a great trying to lock sequence where she's like, God, I, I guess I'm insane or I guess I'm, I have a uh, debilitating disease. Do I have schizophrenia? Is it PTSD? So she learns she's not mentally ill or sick, she's possessed. That'll be a great, yeah, great end of act one um, break. Or it could, it doesn't have to be like something super obvious, but just something that to us says, wait, no, there's something else going on here. It could be something smaller or more subtle. Um, I always like when people fall asleep and they're possessed and they wake up and they've written or drawn something. That's always a nice way to kind of- Oh, I, I definitely am gonna do that. I mean, not not to copy Moon Knight, they had some stuff like that. A oh, lot of fugue state, you know, going on missions before he realized it at the yeah, end. But yeah. I, I definitely like a fugue state or certainly writing on the wall or something. Yes, for sure. And when you say the end of Act One, you mean kind of the big picture end of Act One, like one third in. Yeah, that's right. You say that's when she learned she's possessed? That seems like a nice place to do it, yeah. Got it. Or, or very early in premise scenes. Okay, so or, she had because we just have a lot of premise to get to. We have a lot, you know, um, uh, a setup that is going to require some steps to get through for sure. Okay. So she identifies the soul in her body, a long dead homicide detective. Okay, that could be some fun premise scenes uh, right at the top of Act Two, where she's like in her apartment trying to figure out a way to communicate with him and like trying to work out, can you hear me if I'm talking? Can I hear you if you're talking? Like just figure out how to speak with him in, in general. Um, she figures out what Briggs wants her body for to identify, locate, and take revenge on the killers. And then you're going to want to add in the middle. And she starts to actually do that. Like, we take steps to actually doing that. Make sure that the middle of the show is actually what you described the show as being. 
and then um, we're gonna work up to that all is lost moment, which might be like we're going we're going through um, premise scenes and up to the middle and escalation. It's gonna be probably like she's working with the detective, trying to find the first killer, or she she thinks that she just has to find his killer and put and put that killer away in order to get rid of the ghost. But we're gonna learn it's a whole cult. But you can reveal mm-hmm. the cult uh, like gradually. We don't have to dump that all right away. So yeah, focus on this one villain for the first episode. So we're gonna watch. You know, she's going to have to investigate a 50-year-old cold case, which is not easy, but she has a ghost helping her. So that's going to lead to some interesting tactics there. We're probably going to get a suspect and chase him down, and then our All Is Lost moment is probably going to be something like, the suspect got away. Um, or the suspect is dead, and now there's no way I'm ever going to get rid of the ghost. Something like that, right? Mm. Um, finale, or let's call this Act 3, because finale is a moment in Act 3. It's not The whole thing is not finale, necessarily. Um, okay. So uh, Briggs takes over her body and beats up the assailants. Oh, that could be a great scene. That's like, uh, did you watch Upgrade? Uh, yes. Isn't it awesome? <laughs> yes. Yes. I love Upgrade. <laughs> it's so good. But this is kind of like that because you have the passenger that can take over your body and make you a badass or a secret, you know, like a. Um, yeah. yeah. It's like Upgrade with a ghost. So, exactly. Um, we, uh, he takes over her body, and this is where we sort of see okay, um, this is why he's actually useful to have around, right? Um, this mm-hmm. is what because the whole time they're going to be arguing and bickering and fighting and she wants to get rid of him but this would be a moment where he's like no i'm gonna save you because i i need you as much as you need me this would also be a nice moment for her to realize that he really needs her too um so they beat up a bunch of assailants and maybe this is going to be like you know we track down this old cultist and it turns out he's got a bunch of cultist guards and um our main character beats them all up with the detective's help and is going to probably arrest the bad guy right something like that or i think the we talked about maybe one way or another this is where they realize there's more than one killer right uh, yeah maybe even if, if they it, caught go ahead killer there's more to be done yeah yeah so the detective may not have even known about the cults um maybe it, it he was like uh that was something he was in the process of figuring out at the time and now exactly. it's, been, it's he, he, he this is news to him too so um but in any case we have defeated the villain of this episode Larkin and Briggs strike a deal. Briggs will leave her body when they bring all his killers to justice, and not a second sooner. Larkin stuck with this cop for her is stuck with the cop for her foreseeable future. She gets his assurance that he won't interfere in her illegal activities. Oh, you mean stealing? Briggs agrees, but he seems conflicted and has PTSD. Okay, so you probably want this deal to be struck way earlier um, okay. than the finale because if it's something like. I'm going to bring the people that did this to you to justice. And then we learn the implications of what that agreement are going to mean at the finale, where she's like, wait a minute. Oh crap. I've just got myself. I committed essentially to taking down a whole cult. Cause when I made that promise, I thought that it was only going to be one person. Um, I think that would make sense to have way earlier to learn the true scope and scale of what this is. And then make the agreement doesn't seem to make sense for Larkin to do because why, what does she actually get out of it beyond getting rid of him? Like, it seems like she would want to renegotiate the terms of this if we're only making them now. Um, so if you want to have them be stuck together, then it should... Or maybe does the cult kill someone close to her in, along the course of the investigation? Maybe that could actually be good motivation for her to, to be like, no, I want to take them down now. I love that. I think if she has a I friend, that she, that. like a best friend character that you sort of set up, like, this is going to be the central... Rela- this is going to be the best friend for the whole show. Like her, th- her thieving partner or something like that, or her sister or something. And then in during the course of the show, maybe even like uh, as we head towards that um, finale moment, the, when all the cultists jump out and they uh, are, you know, swarm in to guard their leader, they kill her best friend. And that would be a great sort of um, uh, motivation for the main character to say, you know what, this is now personal to me. It's not just about getting rid of the ghost. I- I'm-, I'm done with these people. They need to be taken down. That, that might help. And also, maybe we could do something cool with the friend's ghost later on. Ooh, that's super cool. Hmm. Love that. Yeah, so um, that's just my couple tips based on what you have here. Middle of this is going to be sort of police procedural, but with a ghost element added in. So make sure that you're make- having all the fun you can with that idea. Remember, your ghost is from the 70s. He doesn't have a sense of what modern technology and policing looks like or what modern police tactics look like or any of those things. So the tips and the suggestions and the way that he's going to be helping her are kind of stuck in the past, and that's a key part of your premise. So r- imagine this character might be like, let's just beat up the suspects, right? <laughs> and then your hero's like, no, you don't, you, you, you don't do that anymore. We're not supposed to do that anymore. Um, 
and that's just going to lead to some really interesting interactions. Like a cop from 50 years ago trying to use his old tactics today, sort of indirectly through this thief character who has seen the worst of what police are like, I imagine, right? It's going to oh, lead to some great. really interesting conversations and dynamics between them. So make sure that you're... When we say you're taking full advantage of your premise, that means we have a scene where your cop character is like, just beat up the suspects, and she's like, no. We have a scene where he's like, all right, just call in the station and, like, you know, report that. And she's like, at what, like a phone booth? I can't just, like, you know, like, he's, he's giving her tactics and advice that he's forced to adjust and learn about the world from her as much as she's forced to use his tactics. So they learn from each other. And in a buddy type, type setup, and this is kind of a buddy cop story, um, often it's going to be one character has to learn something from the other, and the other partner has to learn something from the main character. Usually, if they have two traits that are kind of opposite, like one of them is too emotional and one of them is too emotionless, then they're, the gradual change over the course of the show is that they're going towards meeting in the middle, and like they both gain a piece from the partnership that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And we come to understand by the end that they do make a good team. One of them provides something that the other one doesn't have. So that's just like, look at relationship arcs, and go back to the script camp class on relationship arcs. There's a video of that, um, because that takes you through the sort of just like the steps in a relationship arc, which are, and you're going to want to follow pretty much exactly for this. Those steps. Are those? Uh, sure, I can take them, take you through them now. So they are one, um, the characters. Oh, I just thought, where do I find them? Oh, uh, where do you find the... them? That's in the yeah. script camp video library. Okay. Yeah. You can tell me too if you want. Sure, sure. So the basics of it are the characters meet and it seems like they hate each other or something rubs each other the wrong way right away and they're like oh i can't work with that person anyone but them right and then they're forced together in some way which it seems like they are or in, in yours the steps are kind of they get stuck together and then she realizes that they're stuck together i think that is what the steps would look like here and it's like oh crap i have to get rid of him i can't work with this guy i can't help him and then they're, so as they're forced to work together we come to see the ways that they bounce and clash off each other one of them has this tactic and it's always getting in the way one of them's always getting on the, per the other person's nerves because of that. And we're seeing all the ways that these, what we call braided, braided roses or braided thorns, start to interact. Where we have, you know, they are both two beautiful roses, but when their stems are intertwined, they have thorns that poke and press up against each other. So we're going to see how they, the conflicts they have. And then as we, as they are forced to work together, eventually it's going to reach a crisis point where we, they, um, they are forced to realize, oh wait, but that person is really good at that thing though and they realize oh my partner was really good at that thing they, they'll usually have a split or break off where they're forced to reconcile with the fact that like i can't work with them anymore but then like that's the, the time where they're you know eating ice cream at home alone in bed after the breakup and they're like wait i really miss them i need them and then we come back together and reunite and now that we have some understanding of how we can work together it becomes clear that they should and that they are a perfect team in a way so so um i can go over that again later if you want or um that that class goes into that for like two hours so feel free to review that class and um there's a slideshow that goes with it too if you want to just see the steps all written out but in a buddy partnership show which yours is that's pretty much how it goes and the um the feeling we get at the end should be that we're excited to see them keeping keep working together even though it causes lots of harm and bloodshed perhaps but I think you may need something like the cult kills one of her family members to get us invested enough for the rest of the show. You don't have to do exactly that, but just think of how can we, how can we be rooting for more of this rather than saying at the end of this episode, God, I hope she gets out of this. Like this seems yeah. terrible for her. I can't even see why she's agreeing to do this. Like if it seems like the main things that, she, that we as the audience would do is try to get out of it, then it's hard for us to imagine to, for us to get excited about the character hunting down more cultists. Right. If we're like, oh, no, you should be spending your energy trying to get rid of the ghost. <laughs> then it's hard for us to be like, oh, I, I see. It's hard for us to see the show. Because the show is about girl works with ghost to take down cult. Any questions on this? Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Okay. Um, so does anyone else want to do this? I have time to do one more, probably. If not, that's okay. Your goal for next week is to write out story beats. Like, these are just very early versions of, of story beats here. Um, but you want to come up with the major scenes. So a nice way to do this is if you are in half hour, just go to the bottom of the, um, just go to the, uh, like, you know, a blank space in your script. Just write out act one, act two. Act three, 
and just make a list of hyphens underneath them. In a half hour, you have about five scenes per act. And you can see the whole show like that. It all fits in one little list, in one little page. And it feels more manageable when you just list out the... At least to me, I, I prefer just listing out the little bullet points like this so we can see exactly what the show would sort of look like. Um, for hour long, it's going to be a little different, of course. We have Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, Act 4, and then 5. Um, you don't have to have a super great idea of this, the structural beats, but you can add them in if you want. Um, you know, you can be like intro, catalyst. You can add those things if you'd like, but here at the story beat stage, it's more important that you just include the major events that should occur. Just think of it very broadly as Act 1 is setup, Act 2 confrontation act three finale and resolution okay um dan did you want me to take one more look at yours or are you still working on that i'm still looking but if you want to take a look and see where i what i've got so far sure i'll take a glance at it and then we will go into my example from uh my half hour pilot all right space dogs Okay, so where are we starting? Okay, um, intro. Oh, this is the cold open. I see. So yeah, I folded all these uh, plot points, the acts and uh, uh, stuff. I see. Um, you're gonna want to make sure to end your cold. If this is your cold open, end it with something really compelling. Um, so I'm not, I don't have the answer for you, and I'm not sure what, what that would be yet, but just make sure it's something that we're like, oh, crap, this show is going to be really good. Um, if it's just sort of... I'm saying, hoping to go by the idea of uh, that it's compelling because it's like, wow, these I want to see lots of space battles. Okay. This I mean, feels my space battle nerd drum. Right, but you I can really still end it with a... I just don't want to go into the choreography of every space of every uh, space flight move, you know. You don't have to, but this would just be a nice place to. After this awesome space battle, we see they're being watched by someone, right? Something that just like intrigues us, or or maybe we see like um, there's a leak. Like after this great space battle, they have a victory, but then as they're flying away, there's fuel leaking from the back of your main character's ship, or something like that. Just something that intrigues us and makes us go, oh, I wonder how that's going to play out. I wonder what that means. I wonder what's going to happen there. Um, okay, so then your intro is five or six scenes. That seems about right. Okay, so that's going to take us up to the point where um, the Gek gets mad at him and they are in kind of a fight. Your catalyst, remember, should just be one scene. The catalyst should not be three scenes. So pick one of these things to be the catalyst. I think it's the characters seeing his father die, right? Yeah, it's the scene where it's the, the the scene the catalyst scene is this scene. So should trying locks be everything else afterwards? Even though he's not trying locks by being broken, it's he, hard he to is say. The, he's, he's asking the question, "What do I do now? How do I respond to and react to the catalyst?" Is what we're doing in the scene. Oh, I was just like, "There's catalyst, and then there's trying locks." But I was like, "There's a couple of scenes between both of these." You know what I mean? I think this is all going to be trying locks because we are. That's all about um, reacting to what's just happened and your character asking, what now? What do I do? How do I address this? Like, do I get revenge? Am I, am I too broken to continue might be a question here that we ask, right? So there's all kinds of blocks that we are trying in a way. Um, okay, that's going to lead us up to your break into two where your main character decides he's going to... He's going to go and take on that, that, uh, that satellite himself. So you'll want to just make sure that's really clear. If we're just ending on a determined look, we can't always glean what the character's thinking or what their plan is. So this would be helpful okay. if... It determined was... look, cut back to a quick shot of the satellite. Maybe, or this is usually going to be strongest when it's like your main character is strictly locked in his court, or, you know, confined to his quarters and he's not to leave. And he's like, all right, I won't go blow up the satellite. And then we see he's got the keys to the spaceship in his hand something just clearer that says, oh, that's what he's going to do after this. So we can't always understand exactly a character's inner motivations just by looking at them. An action 
that simple or that showcases what their next plan is going to be is going to be a stronger act break. Um, an act break should just be one single moment, not a series of moments. Everything after this is going to be premise scenes because we'll be going into your next act. Um, and then that looks like we end with about act three. So yeah, you'll have to keep filling this up. But this is looking good so far. Keep doing this, keep organizing, and um, just listing out these major events. And at a certain point, it's easiest, especially with action adventure stories. We know there's going to be a big battle at the end, right? Right. Okay, so put that on the board. So like right out all the way down. Well, I don't bottom. know if it ends on the battle. It ends more like uh, there's still there's like the battle is halfway through, and then there's like, but you guys still are not a, you still haven't formed your your new team yet. Okay, but so there's going to be some kind of action scene as the finale, though is is all I mean. So it's helpful to put that down on the on your plot board and then work backwards from there to make sure that we are leading up to that finale effectively. I just find it useful, especially in this type of story. All right. Thanks for sharing this. Keep working on this. Keep uh, keep deciding on what these scenes are going to be and, and locking stuff into place. And um, you may have to do this again once this is done, just because often I will have to do two drafts of this. Um, but good progress so far, and I think this is shaping up well. Thanks, Dan. So, um, questions from anyone on anything we've talked about today in terms of structure and story beats. Everybody feel pretty good about this? And like they know what to do for next time? I'm going to show you just what to do for next time and then as, before we go into our sort of example. You're going to write out the story beat summary, and you're going to read another professional pilot script and be ready to talk about it for next time. Everybody think they fully get this? OK, let's look a, a little bit at my example. Um, so this is going to be just the, the first draft of the pass at um, Nave, which is my historical dark comedy. And um, this one is a half hour pilot, so I'll show you how the story beats are kind of looking and just give you a sense of what the sketchbook looks like. So I've got about 15, 16 pages of sketchbook for this, including everything from images, video links, and just ideas for scenes, and lots and lots of dialogue, because as a dark com TV dark comedy, there's lots of dialogue in the show. The premise of the show is that it's about a court jester in the medieval era, uh, and um, the Logline might look something like this. So a manipulative jester pulls the strings to keep things running smoothly in the court of a foolish king. That's the idea of the show. The It's a jester that um, manipulates things to keep the kingdom from falling apart as he's you know surrounded by idiots who are doing everything they can to get the kingdom into war and conflict. And he's the one who has to sort of trick people into doing the right thing. Um, so, the pilot logline. The knave develops insomnia and stumbles upon a conspiracy to overthrow the king brewing among the knight staff of the castle. A plot he must infiltrate and neutralize. So, the plot of the pilot is that um, I've approached the plot of this pilot as sort of the way that you should often do is justifying the premise of the show and like sort of setting the premise of the show up so that we understand why, why we're watching this, why this is important. Um, and to that end, I kind of had to make the pilot episode about the the main thing that the show is about, which is the knave, who does not have a name, by the way, or does not share his name. Um, he is uh, keeping things running smoothly, and he is making sure that the, the, the aristocracy, the nobles, don't, you know, they don't uh, plunge the kingdom into chaos, and he's making sure nobody invades the kingdom. He's just keeping things safe and secure, and um, sort of examining what his role is here. Um, so that's what our pilot is going to focus on. It's sort of showing... What does the knave do? How does he work? How does he operate? And by the end, he's going to change just a little bit because TV is about very gradual change. And as this is a status quo show, um, we are setting up many m other future episodes without having some big overarching story. Um, so let's look at the story beats for this. Oh, well, let's look at the character list first, actually, I guess. Um, so our main character is the knave. He's a jester. Um, and uh, he is about 30 years old. Um, and he has severe arthritis in both of his knees, so he kind of hobbles around, which 
Um, it turned out that a lot of people with disabilities in this period would find employment um, as enter entertainers in some form or, or another, so I thought that was interesting. And also, I have similar knee issues, so I just thought it'd be kind of fun to write this character like this. Let's look at the um, character list. Where did I have the character list? Here we go. Okay, so we've got the Knave. He's our main character here. We've got a division in the cast. Of, as any show set in a castle is going to have a distinction between upstairs and downstairs, right? So we have the upper class, which are going to have more Anglo-Saxon type names. Or sorry, um, we're going to have the upper class is going to have more Greek or you know Castilian Spanish type names, whereas the lower classes are going to have more Anglo-Saxon names with a lot more um, letters. Like you know, we see this kind of AE combo letter. I forget what this is called, but um, just to distinctify. You know, this is not really actually taking place in any in particular country or in... Um, this is like sort of a uh, an aggregation of different cultures at the time. So I didn't want to make it too culturally specific, but let's look at our main characters here. We have the Knave. We have the Foolish King. This is sort of our other character mentioned in the logline. This is the guy that's in charge of the kingdom. He's kind of a macho man who never backs down from a fight or a challenge, and he's always causing conflict um, and, you know, starting wars, raising taxes... He's kind of a blowhard drunkard who doesn't care. He doesn't think things through and is, as a result, always keeping the kingdom right on the edge of falling apart. We have his new queen, who uh, is named Queen Alba. She's his um, second or third wife, um, and uh, she's brand new here. She's going to be our knave's main rival. So we'd like to, when we design a cast of characters, always be picking, designing them in relation to the main character. So we have, you know, this guy is sort of his, we could say his co-worker, in that he has to constantly keep the king on track and make sure he's doing the right stuff and make sure he's making the right decisions we have the queen who's like his rival we have the young princess who's only nine years old um who isn't is not quite a rival for the knave but causes a lot of trouble for him though he does see a lot of interesting potential in her because she's the only one around here who actually seems to have a good head on her shoulders so secretly he's going to start trying to kind of mentor her into being a good person we have a chambermaid and a night watchman who are going to play big roles in the pilot because they are going to be the sort of um, the lower the members of the night staff who are starting this insurrection against the king we have a lord chancellor who is kind of the king's second in command he's 75 years old and he's an idiot so we he's like a an, an antagonist but a very ineffective one um who the knave is constantly running circles around so just kind of a fun relationship there and i have a couple other ideas for other roles that i've not yet filled in yet because i've only you know I've, i'm not actually actively writing on this this is something i've just been coming back to now and again but I had ideas for Marshal of Arms, Spymaster, and High Priest, which are just other kind of roles in the administration of a castle. And we have a couple other ideas, like a bard, or maybe a groom, um, just different roles amongst the peasants and the knight staff of the castle, too. So that's the characters. Let's look at the um, our list of scenes. Um, and this is going to be broken up Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. And I haven't fully delineated what they are here, but it's nice to have just this shorthand version so we start with the cold open. The knave is giving one of his performances to a group of nobles and sort of by introducing the audience to this idea of what is a jester and what do they do? What does a jester look like? Um, and how does he kind of, you know, ply his trade here? You see, uh, we have a scene with the knave and the king where in the king, basically, we realize he is keeping the knave around because he wants to learn how to be funny and he wants to learn how people are using satire against him because he doesn't really have a sense of humor. Um, and the knave has to constantly trick him into doing the right stuff. The knave is very concerned that there's going to be a rebellion of peasants soon. And the king is basically not listening because he doesn't think the peasants matter. In fact, he's even like, oh, great. Yeah, we ha let's let the peasants, let's let the representative of the peasant congregation speak. That chair, that'll be the peasants chair. Oh, wait, look, it's empty. There's none of them here. We don't care what they think. Um, our follow-up scene is going to follow the knave and the queen as she starts an audit of the castle. This is going to be our primary B story. She is... Um, adding up how much everything is costing around the castle and is looking for things to cut and she doesn't really know what the knave does and she's very suspicious of him that he's influencing her husband too much so the b story is going to revol revolve around the knave trying to avoid the queen's suspicion the knave and the princess is going to be the scene that directly follows that in which we see the princess sets up our c story which she says i want to do the right thing here we're going to set up you as the master of festivities are going to help me set up a big performance for the poor in honor of the poor and we're going to throw that on in three days. And um, she just is always making demands of him. And he's always expected to kind of, um, you know, bow to her every whim. And so the knave is forced to put on a big show, basically, for the the peasants to try to calm them down for and make them not rebel. That's what the princess thinks will work. Okay, that's our A, B, and C stories established in the first three scenes. So following that, the knave gets really stressed out. And he spends the nights wandering the castle with insomnia. 
at which point in scene four he's going to meet the night staff and he although he doesn't really have that much in common with them he sort of accidentally starts to become friends with them and they kind of start to trust him so um we may have a short montage of him being friend be like befriending them over the next couple of days i'm not quite sure how to work this yet but maybe we see that they've already been talking before they're already kind of friends but in any case um scene five is thinking he's one of them Wolfren, the chambermaid, invites him to a secret meeting for all the servants that she has organized, and it turns out they're plotting to overthrow the king. Cut to commercial. Cliffhanger, right? So his new friends amongst the night staff of the castle, it turns out they're actually creating a secret plot. And the knave is now going to be forced to react to and respond to that in our act two. Um, so that's what act one looks like, probably. I mean, like I said, this is just my first pass at this. But act two is going to focus on the night staff. And now that we've gone from the upstairs to the downstairs... We're going to see what the these um, you know the, the paupers and the poor of the kingdom, we're going to get their point of view in Act 2. So, the knave goes to the secret meeting in our first scene, and he hear, hears Wolfren and Elfrith. That's the, other, the two organizers of this staff. It's a castle guard, and it's a chambermaid. They have very legitimate grievances against the tyrannical elite. He's like, they're raising, they're like, you know, our taxes are way too high. They execute us for even stepping out of line. They're always oppressing us and recruiting us as conscripts for their armies. We're done with it. These nobles are crazy. We want to get rid of them. So the knave tries to convince them to give this up. He says, for the good of the kingdom, like, you don't want to take charge now. Things are too politically volatile. He's like, I'll take your concerns to the king. But he ends up losing their trust when they start to realize, wait, maybe he's not actually one of them. He acts like one of them, and he uses the servant's entrance, but he's not one of them at all. And they start to suspect that his loyalties lie elsewhere. So the mob of peasants takes him to a disused latrine and prepares to murder the knave. And he's sort of forced to use his gestury to explain to them why they can't take over right now. He uses metaphors that they will understand, which is a big part of the hook of the show. It's about a manipulative, manipulative excuse me, gesture who has to speak in language that people will understand and use metaphors, insinuation, and storytelling to kind of convince them to do the right thing. So he, um, you know, manages to convince the peasants to back off and let him bring this up with the king. And it turns out that the two organizers of the peasants, they lose control of the mob. And basically, the knave warns them, don't fuck with the fool. Um, so he goes to the king and tries to, in our scene four of act two, he tries to explain to the king what their concerns are. The king doesn't listen, so he tries to put it in terms of a puppet show, which is the only thing the king really pays attention to. But it just pisses the king off, so he makes things even worse. He raises taxes even more, basically. The queen comes to suspect that the knave is plotting the rebellion himself. We end act two with another cliffhanger. The knave goes back to the rebels and basically says, all right, who have you got? Let me review your candidates, and I'll let you know if you have somebody that I think should take over. Then we go into Act 3. Now that the main character has changed his course of action again, um, he is now going to consider actually allowing this insurrection to take place. So, Act 3 is going to look like this. Scene 1, the knave is very disappointed by all the candidates. Um, they end up asking him, I don't know, do you want to be king? And he's just like, no. People kill those. Um, so he pleads with them to see sense. He's like, you, can't, you don't have anyone that's eligible to actually take over. This is really complicated to run a kingdom. It's not as easy as just overthrow the king, then you're in charge, and it's all, you know, it's downhill from there. And he lets it slip about the upcoming festival. Remember, our C story is he's or organizing this festival on behalf of the princess. So they're gonna, they decide, hey, let's use that. We're going to use that big performance as an opportunity to assassinate the king. Um, so we then go into scene three wherein the knave is setting up this festival he knows is going to be interrupted by this assassination attempt, but the poppers have basically said, you have no choice, don't mess with this or you're dead. He decides to take charge of the rehearsals for the acrobatics himself, and he, we intercut the, um, the rebellion plotting their assassination and rehearsing it with him plotting and rehearsing the uh, acrobatic performance, which um, the finale is he's going to make a big, giant, you know, hefty acrobat, and uh, like jump off a springboard and land on a trapdoor, and that's going to be like the big finale. So we don't know what the knave is plotting here. We know he's working on solving all these problems somehow, but we just don't see how it's all going to come together until the finale. This is kind of like one of those great um, in Sherlock Holmes stories. They do this all the time, don't they? Where it's like Holmes is like, ah, I have an idea, and we see him do stuff for a while until finally we reveal, oh, that's how it all comes together in the end. So uh, scene four is the assassination attempt, the grand finale. Um, you know is at the the, pe the peasants have decided at the grand finale that their assassin will jump out of the trap door and shoot a crossbow at the king and kill him and the knave in the meantime has rehearsed the performance so that an acrobat will land on top of that trap door at the at the moment that they plan to jump out so we see that kind of fall into place and then um as the assassin bursts from the trap door a big hefty acrobat lands on it and breaks his neck and crushes him and the knave is like you know well done um, so, last couple scenes here is 
he pleads to save, or the knave tries to save the leader of the insurrection, the chambermaid, who kind of got out of her control and he like thinks she's a good person and had legitimate problems. So he tries his best to save her and just can't. Um, they're going to take them all away to be executed, essentially. And in those last moments, this is a really sad scene where he comes to realize, oh, uh, I actually can't just keep things running smoothly. I have to be the voice for the voiceless. I'm going to have to speak for these people and be the representative, the sort of secret representative in the court. Um, they're all taken away and executed. Our final scene, this is like the sort of stinger. The knave is in the throne room. Um, and when everybody else is out, it's all middle of the night. And uh, he ends up standing up out of the throne, and he goes and he sits in that empty chair that the king left for the empty for the peasants. He was like, who's going to speak for them? That's right, no one. So the knave comes over, and he sits in the chair. He's ready to finally fall asleep at last, because remember, our main problem was he is trying to keep things running smoothly, but he is developing insomnia from all the stress of keeping this together. He's going to finally fall asleep until finally in the, the king and the lords burst into the throne room in the middle of the night. They're, like, getting ready to start an invasion or a war or something, and they're like, what do you think, Knave? And he's just like, how about a show? And we kind of understand that he's saying, there's no sleep for the foolish. It's going to take my constant vigilance to keep things from falling apart here. And I'm going to have to be the voice for those who can't actually make their concerns heard. That's the show. That's 15 scenes. Um, five scenes per act, beginning, middle, and end. I didn't write out the structural beats yet, but I will add those in as I fine tune this further. Um, but that's what it looks like. It's only, how long is this? Less than a page, right? A little less than a page. Um, that's a half-hour show, and how I plot them and how I approach them and just some of the considerations that I have in mind while plotting. Let me pause and see if... Does anyone have any questions on this process or what story beats would kind of look like for your show? No questions? Okay. Uh, Roger says, how many scenes per act in a drama? Maybe six. Uh, there's not really a hard rule on this. This is just useful when you're trying to figure out, like, the general shape of the scenes. Um, just write out, like, six bullet points. Imagine they're, like, two-ish pages each. But then beyond that, you can, once you write them all out, you might be like, okay, this one's a little shorter, so I have room for another one. This one might be a longer, so I don't have room for that one. And it'll just help you to start to see the shape of things. But don't worry, there's not, like, a required number of scenes per act or anything like that. Other questions? Everyone clear on what to do for next week? And feel confident about their pilot and logline? All right, if everyone's all set, then we will call it for now. Um, we will uh, resume next week with scene cards. So your goal for next time is to write the full story beat summary, just like what I showed you here, and um, get a really good sense of what happens in each act. It doesn't have to be really comprehensive, but just do as much as you can, and always remember to read a full pilot. Is there um, a place where we can review, look at your uh, your uh, nave version, so we can just use it as like a point of reference? Um, not yet. Um, we'll, if you wait a couple weeks, perhaps, or maybe even early next year, it'll 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 be a while before I have that kind of finished and ready to share as a document. I will at some point, though. Good question. All right, I was just because it looked like it would be a great chance of scope. It's um the easiest way to do it is just list out the little bullet points under each act, and um it's nothing more complicated than that really. But um I will at some point share it. It's just not quite complete enough yet. Did somebody else have a question? I think I heard another voice. Yeah, my uh, connection was messing up, but uh, I did have a question. Mm -hmm. um, it's fine, right? If like the intro sequence goes on like to three pages, because uh, I was writing it and it ended up <laughs> I ended up writing like three pages of the first scene, and I was like, the cold open. Uh, it's like it's a. Uh, it's not like a cold open. There's not like a cold open in this one. It just like starts type thing. Sure. That's fine. Yeah. You can have a three page opening scene. Sure. All right. I just didn't know if that was like, if that's like too long for like an opening scene. Or... No, no, not at all. Not if it's great. 
Oh, well, one can hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll yeah. That's the thing, is that no great scene is too uh, long, and no... What, what, what am I trying to say? A scene, If a scene is working, people won't really care how long it is, unless it's more than four pages, at which point we'll be like, okay, that's like half your act. Um, four pages plus right. is starting to get to too long. But one to three is like most scenes are going to be one to three pages, for sure. All right, thank you. Sure. Other questions? All right, if there's no more questions, we'll wrap it up for now. Story beats next week, and then we'll move on to expanding that into scene cards. Thanks for coming by, folks. We're looking forward to seeing you at your next Script Camp event. Amanda's fantasy group is today at 5 o'clock if you're interested in talking about um, recent fantasy stuff you've been reading, watching, or writing. Um, we'll see you guys then. Have a great day.